Hello guys and gals, and this is part 15 of our reading of Twilight Zone. Rod Sterling's Twilight Zone to be exact, 26 Unforgettable Explorations into the Realm of the Supernatural, adapted by Walter P. Gibson, and he did a really good job of it. Um, we're going to go over the copyright information, which will be on your screen right now. Um, says here, Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone is copyright 1963 by Cayuga Productions Incorporated, and Rod Serling's Twilight Zone Revisited, copyright 1964 by Cayuga Productions Incorporated, all rights reserved. This 1983 edition is published by Bonanza Books and, dist and distributed by Outlet Book Company, Incorporated, a random house company, and it gives the address if you're interested in that. This book was previously published as two separate works entitled Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone and Rod Serling's Twilight Zone Revisited. Printed and bound in the United States of America, it gives the Library of Congress number if you're interested in that. Anyways, we finished off... The Curse of Seven Towers, and that was a rather long story. Now, we are ready for a new one, actually. It timed perfectly, ending the story timed perfectly with when we were supposed to quit, so here we go. We are going to read The Tiger God. This is the story of the Tiger God, as Harold Greylock told it. The story must be true, for Greylock not only witnessed many of the things he told about, he was, he was in at the kill and could produce sworn affidavits. As for the other por portions of the strange tale, they fitted the pattern like the missing pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It began at the Great British Empire Expedition held at Wembley in London in 1924. There, Greylock saw some fine display of historic diamonds from India. And he also watched a clever show put on by a troupe of Hindu magicians. So he went to India to see if he could buy rare diamonds for the American market, and also to look for even better magicians, figuring that they would be a they would be a sensation throughout the United States. In big cities of India, Greylock met with a double disappointment. He saw little that was worthwhile in diamonds and was told that he would have to deal with native princes who had hordes of such gems. Okay, as for the street corner, oh, as for the street corner magicians or Jadu Wallas, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, as they were called, they were far inferior to the troop that had gone to Webley, a Wembley, sorry. Greylock heard talk of, a, of remarkable yogis who lived in Himalayan caves and floated in midair when the mood seized them, but they were hard to find. He also learned of an in-between group called Fakirs, more clever than the Jadu Wallas and more worldly than the yogis, but they worked only for the privileged classes, not for the street corner trade. They were pampered in the palaces of the princes, where gates were hard to crash. Then Greylock learned of a Raja of Bildapur, the kindly ruler of a tiny domain that occupied only about a dozen square miles. Most of it, however, was... <coughs> Most of it was an actual diamond mine, so the Raja had an, an abundance of such gems. His palace also was always open to magicians and holy men who made pilgrimages to Benares and other sacred places, while troops of fakirs often stopped there. So, Greylock took a train to Bildapur, which was no more than a flag stop, flag stop? Okay, flag stop on a branch line. Dressed in tropical white suit and pith helmet, he arrived at the palace and was ushered into the presence of the Raja of Bildapur, a handsome, bearded man of middle age whose vigor belied his years. A hunter and sportsman, he raided the best rifle shot in that part of India, though he had to travel outside his limited domain to get, to get at wild game. Even when 
receiving visitors, the Raja wore a simple native costume with only one diamond in his turban and another on a chain around his neck. With him was his daughter, the Princess Halani, or Hal Halina, sorry, Halina, whose large dark eyes smiled a welcome through the lips of her perfect, perfect oval face formed an expressionless straight line. Hal um, Halina wore diamond earrings, but the stones, though perfectly matched, were small, while her bracelets were plain gold bands. The Raja's secretary, um, Shalbar, was a man in his early 30s who wore a conservative English business suit like some underclerk in an, um, in an obscure government office. However, his military haircut and short-clipped mustache gave him an air of authority, and his keen eyes sized up people in one quick glance. Shal um, Shalbar applied that process to Greylock, a big bluff a big bluff, friendly man of 35, Greylock had a know-it-all manner that could ruffle people, but he was quick to soft pedal the boisterous mood, showing courtesy and appreciation that won people over because they had misjudged him. To the Raja of Bildapur, Greylock delivered a speech so well rehearsed that it sounded natural. All over the world, Greylock de declared, I have seen diamonds stolen from one set of crown jewels and placed in another. I have seen fine stones cut into smaller ones to satisfy some whim. I have seen diamonds with curses, their brilliance wasted because of the greed that had tarnished them. So I came to build a poor because here alone there are diamonds which have been mined, kept and cherished by their rightful owners and their descendants. All that are a real all that are a real part of your family heritage would stay here. Should stay here. But if you could spare any f for true diamond lovers in other countries, I should like to place them at your agent, Mr. Greylock," replied the Raja in a heartfelt tone. "Many people have wanted to exploit my diamonds for cold base profit. To meet someone like yourself, a man who feels as I do, is welcome indeed. This will take thinking before I can give an answer." If I could make it worth your while to stay here for an extended visit, I shall be overjoyed. Your Highness, Greylock replied smoothly, I have been searching for higher things in the field of oriental magic. I have heard that there are fakirs whose skill far exceeds the disappointing tricks of the Jadu Wallas. I have been, to been told that such fakirs often come here as do other mystics. The Raja stroked his beard and turned to Shalbar. Send for Kalma, the fakir who performs real jadu. He said said he would undergo um, shamadi whenever we asked. Now we can put him to the test. Then to Greylock, the Raja exclaimed, Shamad, um, Shamadi is a form of suspended animation. Through such power, a fakir like Kalma can remain buried alive for a month or more. It took several days to locate Kalma. Meanwhile, Greylock saw other mystics at work, if it could be called such. One was Bardu, a thin, scrawny, bearded man who wore only a loincloth and sat cross-legged in a low alcove at the end of the palace courtyard. Bardu, um, Bardu's eyes had a faraway stare and his lips were always moving very slightly. Bardu is an adept, stated the Raja, whom seldom leaves this niche. He subsists on very little food or water, and he remains in Pad Padmasana, the lotus position in which you, see, you now see him. He recites mantras or verses through, uh, through mant mantra yoga. He can attain samadhi, and the sublime state that frees the mind from the body. Greylock felt that Bardu might already have attained samadhi, for the adept paid no attention to the, inter the introduction, but Greylock maintained a discreet silence, while the Raja pointed out other mystics who were practicing hatha yoga, as he termed it. 
One was combining the lotus position with a handstand. Another was gripping his ankles with his hands and rocking on his stomach. The Raja had names for such poses and gave the lesser yogis his approval, um, though Bardu was the only one who rated as an adept in the Raja's estimate. Um, okay. Okay. Greylock, who saw, saw, um, saw, um, sorry, sadhus and other ascetics who lay beds, uh, who lay on beds of spikes or hung head down over smoldering fires. Some like, uh, some were crawling like inchworms, simply stopping off at the Raja's palace during their creeping pilgrimage. The Raja of Bildapur pitied such sadhus because uh, more than he approved them. Self-torture is not the true path to the light, he declared, but it does show subjugation of worldly desire, which is the first step to something higher. To their minds, each movement, each moment of torture is a precious gem. That made Greylock think of diamonds, though he carefully avoided mentioning them. One day, however, the Raja brought up the subject himself. I am saving my wealth for my people, he said. The diamonds that I have inherited belong equally to the, the descendants of the men who minded them and to my loyal subjects. I am keeping them in a secret repository to which two men alone have access, myself and my faithful, my faithful secretary, Shalbar. That explained why Shalbar had been suspicious of Greylock at the start. But by now, Greylock and Shalbar had become great friends. They had found that both had served in France during World War I. Greylock with the American army and Shalbar with the, Brit with the British. Also, they were both fond of pets, and Greylock became chums with a mongoose named Juju, which spent much of its time on Shalbar's shoulder, except when it was chasing cobras and killing them. Juju soon began jumping on Greylock's shoulder, too. Then came the big day when Kalma the Fakir arrived at the palace with a troop of assistants. Though attired in, in simple robe and plain turban, Kalma was tall and imposing. With hypnotic eyes and a gleaming smile, Greylock was disappointed, though, when Kalma began to show begin his show with the basket trick in which he pushed a boy down into an oval basket then squatted in the basket himself and finally thrust a sword through through it to prove that the boy was gone i've seen that before greylock told shabar the boy coils inside the basket and the fake gear takes care not to stab him it's a very old trick you think so queried um shabar watch what kelma does next the fakir was peering into the basket, and though wondering where the oh, as though wondering where the boy could have gone, suddenly he lifted the basket with one hand so he could look beneath it and sweep the solid tiling of the court with his other hand. He then slammed down the basket, spread a cloth over it, whipped whipped away the covering, and there was the boy standing in the basket. But how could he pick up the basket? Uh, sputtered Greylock. With the boy in it, Kelma couldn't possibly have lifted that weight with one hand. By then, Kelma was beginning another trick. In a corner of the courtyard, where the earth was deep, he set a, up a little tent formed by three sticks and a cloth. Beneath, he planted a mango seed, which first grew to a sprout, then to a small bush. I know that one, said Greylock. I saw it in Bombay. He poked in a sprout, then a mango branch from those cloths that are lying about all about. Greylock stopped abruptly by now. Kalma's assistants were were raising large, larger poles and using all the cloths to cover them. Green branches sprouted from the top of the huge tent and the cloths scattered like a bursting cocoon, revealing a 12-foot mango tree. The Raja turned to Greylock and told him. 
you'll find that the roots are firmly planted as, as with all Kalmas trees. But now you will see something still more wonderful, the fabled rope trick. Kelma took the end of a coil of rope and flung it some 30 feet in the air, where it, it remained mysteriously suspended. He shouted for the boy, who came running into the courtyard and climbed the rope like a monkey to the level of the palace roof, where Greylock noted, which, uh, which Greylock noted was three stories high. Kelma gave a loud cry and a hand clap. The boy vanished instantly, and the rope plopped down to the courtyard, while Greylock stared at it, at oh, at the cloudless blue sky, the brilliant sunlight that showed the waving, the weaving leaves of palm trees. Nothing more. That evening, the Raja of Bildapur insisted that Kalma's mystery um, depended upon a subtle force called the Kundalini which awakened the chakras or psychic centers of the body and developed hidden powers. These included leg legima, the ability to reduce weight to nothing, and that was how Kalma lifted the basket. Another was Ishita, the creation by thought alone, which accounted for the mango tree. The rope trick, the Raja said, was due either to to prapti, the power of instantaneous travel, or to pra prakamya, a form or of instant reala uh, realization of whatever a person wanted. Juju the mongoose interrupted the Raja's dissertation by a sudden clatter from Sh um, Shaobar's shoulder. Everyone looked towards the door, and there stood Kalma himself. The fakir bowed, to the Raja, then stated in an event in an even tone, Tonight, while I was in deep contemplation, I had a vision of the very near future. I have come here to reveal it. First I saw a long table with several men. Some in uniform beyond were windows. Through them I saw a wall, a gate, I heard a voice calling for the Raja of Bildapur. The council chamber at Delphi, exclaimed Raji. The, uh, exclaimed Raja. They want. Uh, they must want me there. I shall get ready to leave as soon as official word arrives. You cannot go to to, Del uh, to, to Delhi, de declared um, Kalma firmly. Something more important demands your presence here. But what could be more important than the council? In my second vision, Kalma resumed his slow tone, I saw people running from huts. I heard them cry. Bag Zalum, and I saw a watchman laying dead in a pool of blood beside him. I saw the head man of a village saying, Bag, Bag Zalum, and again the people shouted in terror, Bag Zalum, the tiger god, save, save us from him. Then the vision faded, and I saw no more. For, for long moments, the Raja of Bildapur sat glumly, grimly silent. Then he declared, I have heard of Bag Zalum, a tyrant among tigers, so bold, so deadly, that there is said to be a secret cult that worships him as a tiger god. This vision of, of Kalmus can only mean that Bag Zalim, Bag Zalum now threatens my domain. Whether he is a killer tiger or an evil spirit it is my duty to protect my people from him. The Raja turned to Shalbar and told the, told the solemn-faced secretary, When the summons comes from Del Delhi, I shall send you in my, ste in my stead, while I stay here and prepare to deal with Bag Zalum, the tiger god. Greylock was astonished at the way the Raja accepted Kalma's vision as established fact, but when he thought back to the wonders that he himself had seen the fakir perform, he decided that Kalma might be capable of anything. Later, Greylock broached the point to Shalbar, who agreed without the slightest reservation. All that the Raja, uh, all, all that the, ra the, ra uh, the Raja, all the Raja said about Kalma's power is true, asserted Shalbar, and 
more besides, his visions never fail, as you will learn. The next morning, Greylock saw Kalma perform th more wonders. The fakir breathed on a stone, and it became a live baby chicken. He made more stones come to life until he had a flock of chickens running about the courtyard. He placed them in a small basket, inverted it, and instead of the chicks, out came a horde of young hissing snakes that made for cracks in the tiling before Juju could spring from Shalbar's shoulder and catch them. The Raja of Bildapur attributed this to the power of Vashta, though uh, through which inanimate objects could be imbued with life and changed from one form to another. Also, through, through such power, objects could be moved without touching them. Kalma provi um, proved that by waving his hand towards a huge water jug that immediately wobbled and then jounced, jounced itself all about the courtyard. As the great jar rocked past Bardu, who was seated in his niche, Greylock saw the old adept stare turn into a glare of disapproval after the jar finally stopped over by the mango tree and Kalma had departed with a bow. Greylock asks the, the Raja, <coughs> What about the adept? What about an adept? An, an, an adept? What about an adept, an adept like Bardu? Why does he just sit and watch? Why can't he perform miracles far beyond Kalmus? He can, rejoined the Raja, though Lagima, Bardu, oh, through Lagima, Bardu can float in midair, retain his, fo his lotus posture, that is a common practice among the Mahatmas in the Himalayas, who also utilize Vashta to drive wild animals away from their caves, but a true Mahatma reserves these forces for his development or for self-protection, never as public show. Instead of diverging from the main path by following such branches, the true adept, like Bardu, continues his upward progress to, to um, Samadhi, the highest bow of the mystical tree called Yoga. Then, then Kalma is one who preferred to develop his lesser forces? Exactly. But he has gone far because he has worked for good instead of gain. Kalma became a fakir to convince skeptics like you that power of yoga does exist. If he worked for gain, the good would, have, would be turned to evil as wine is turned to vinegar. The Raja gave a convulsive shudder then. But do not worry, Kalma would never debase his art by accepting even a rupee for his performance. That wilted Greylock's hope of, ta of taking Kalma back to America and having him perform the genuine India Indian rope trick in big outdoor stadiums. Instead, Greylock decided to concentrate on the diamond business, that same afternoon, he was amazed when an official telegram arrived from Delhi, fulfilling Kalma's first prophecy. It stated that the Raja of Bildapur, or a fully accredited representative, was needed at, at an important conference. That special phrase meant that Shalbar could go instead of the Raja, and oh, as Kalma had recommended. Orders were given to flag the one the one daily train that passed through Bildapur, and the Raja sent Shalbar to the station in the royal car, a shiny new Model T Ford touring car, which was also the only automobile in in Bildapur. Shalbar, uh, about, about to leave, shook hands with Greylock and remarked, If you aren't going to that... Oh. If you aren't going on that tiger hunt, why don't you take charge of Juju? The little booger, oh no, the little beggar, is moping in my room and needs a friend like you. He will perch on your shoulder by day and sleep on your bed by night, so you won't be bothered by cobras. They stay away. They stay far away from a mongoose. The royal car drove away, and Greylock went to find the moping mongoose Juju, following Greylock immediately and slept on his bed that night. Next morning, they had a late breakfast together with Juju nibbling biscuits that Greylock 
offered him. Meanwhile, a loud shouting began in the courtyard, so Greylock went to the window and saw a group of excited natives bowing, kneeling, and, ap and appealing to the Raja, while Princess Hel um, Helena stood silently by. Greylock asked the Chakra, or houseboy, to interpret what was being said. They are from an, out, an outlying village, informed the Chakra, near the great game preserve where His Highness often hunts. Last night, they had a tiger scare, and they found a watchman dead at the crossroads. Just like the um, guy said. We are going to... The next paragraph is kind of long. We're going to have to stop this here. Um, we have been reading from Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. 26 Unforgettable Explorations into the Realm of the Supernatural. It is adapted by Walter P. Walter B. Gibson. And if you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way or if you want to join the Discord server, all the information will be in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.